Well, let's open our time together with a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time together on a Sunday to gather and to learn about your grace, O oh Lord. Help us to put aside everything that would distract us from you in our lives, O oh Lord, and to focus on your love and your grace towards us. In the name of your Son, amen. Well, before we begin the actual um, uh, class, I figured... Oops. We're using this book uh, called Seculosity. And um, Seculosity is written by David Zoll. And uh, David Zoll founded this uh, wonderful ministry called Mockingbird. And Mockingbird um, is looking for the song of grace sounded in a thousand different ways throughout life. So they are looking at pop culture, at politics, at philosophy, theology, and everyday sort of stories. And they're really trying to find how God is speaking into our everyday lives. And they have this wonderful website. It has lots of articles by David Zoll and other people. Um, they have a, a print magazine. Um, and actually, the magazine for this quarter is on sports. Uh, so if this topic is interesting to you, you should read that. Um, and they also have podcasts and a, a, a yearly conference they do every um, April in um, New York. But again, the whole point of um, Mockingbird is to find that song of grace. And I think Seculosity kind of plays into that philosophy. So, Seculosity of Fandom. Um, if you... Oops. Unfortunately, if you thought you were coming to a class just on sports, I had to kind of broaden our topic for today. The, the chapter is actually on fandom itself. Um, but of course, sports is probably the biggest example of fandom in our lives. Um, so um, before we begin, I'd like to just kind of backtrack and talk about what this term seculosity means. So what is seculosity? In case you've missed it, seculosity is all about replacement religiosity. So we as Americans, we started the course by talking about how we've been going to church less and less, and there's all sorts of graphs to prove this, that over the last 50 years, and not only church membership, but even church attendance has declined and declined and declined. But the, uh, the counter to that is somehow we keep getting more and more religious in our lives. So how is that happening? What is so important about religion? Well, religion, as we discussed, gives us a controlling story with which to make sense of the world, it's a worldview that helps us to sort of interpret all the events that happen around us. It gives us a controlling story. It also gives us a list of rules, ways to spend our time, ways to spend our money, ways to spend our efforts. So that list of rules. And then religion gives us something to lean on in times of trouble, something that gives us comfort. But finally, religion gives us righteousness. Religion gives us a way of knowing that somehow we are enough. In Christianity, we use that term, righteousness, and I think people outside the church don't understand what that term means, but it's really all about being enough. And in traditional religion, we worry about a sort of vertical direction of righteousness, being enough before God, and improving our inner selves to be enough before God. In seculosity, our replacement religiosity, we focus on enoughness in the vertical direct, I'm sorry, the horizontal direction how we are enough before other people. So we know that we are always falling short in this pursuit. There's this kind of ideal of our perfect selves in our minds. And so we need self-justification, which is a way to edit our outward selves to prove to other people by the way we talk, by the way we dress, by the way we act, that we are enough. So seculosity, in a nutshell, is a replacement religiosity that doesn't focus on the vertical, but instead focuses on the horizontal and being enough in front of other people. So we've been looking at a different uh, sort of series of, of different types of seculosities that appear in our lives. But today we are focusing on the seculosity of fandom and sports. And so we, before we begin, I wonder if you might take a few moments and just jot down on your sheet the answer to these questions. Name one thing you are a big fan of and how did you become a fan? Have you ever judged another person based on what they're a fan of? Have you been judged? And finally, name one famous celebrity or athlete who has been thrown into secular hell. Hmm. 
Yes? We'll find out about that, but who, who has been uh, knocked off their pedestal? Anyone want to share what they're a fan of? Sports? Yes? Gators. Gators. Okay, there you go. <laughs> go Gators. <laughs> Except I, I'm actually a Seminole fan, but that's okay. <laughs> Do you have anything, Ann? Okay. And how did you come to become a fan of the Olympics? Mm-hmm. And it comes every, only once in four years, right? So, yeah. do you have anything? College football. College football. There you go. Are you a Gators fan? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> how about you? We're NBA. Yeah. NBA. Okay. There you go. The whole, okay. Do you have a favorite team? Uh, okay, there you go. Uh, I'm not an NBA fan, but I've heard they created that really impressive bubble that, that, that yeah. kept everyone safe, and it was very extreme. Like they had to. <laughs> right, right. There you go. So, uh, <laughs> For those of you watching, Tom just said that he is a judge of uh, Duke fans. So being from North Carolina, I guess that's a, a thing. Well, what is a fan anyways? Um, the word actually has a fascinating history that I didn't even know before reading the book. Um, fan is short for fanatic. And fanatic comes from the Latin word fanaticus. And a fanaticus is a worshiper in a temple, uh, in a Roman or Greek, a, a pagan temple. Someone who would go to the Roman temple, offer sacrifices, make sure that the temple kind of mechanics sm uh, flowed smoothly. So to be a fanatic is to be a temple worshiper. The term came into the English language in the early 1900s with the advent of baseball. Uh, the owner of the St. Louis Stockings uh, decided that he wanted uh, to maximize the people coming to his stadium, so he did the thing that would probably do this the best. He offered 25-cent beer, <laughs> and people flocked to come watch his uh, baseball team and to drink the, the cheap beer, and he called these people coming into his stadium fans. That's where, the, that's where the term comes from, from baseball. But of course, from baseball, fandom has grown and grown and grown. Does anyone know, I've kind of got it on here, but does anyone know the biggest college football stadium? Michigan. Do you know how many it seats? Yeah. They've, I think it's officially it's like 105,000, but they've managed to get 115,000 people packed in that stadium before. So that's kind of crazy. Um, I, th I think that's the biggest stadium in America, but the NFL also has really impressive stadiums. AT&T Stadium is the current biggest NFL stadium. Um, it uh, houses 80,000 fans. I think they built a bigger one just recently in Los Angeles, but they haven't actually had people in it yet. Um, it's a really cool stadium, though. And then, um, of course, fandom is not just an American thing. Uh, that is Wimbledon Stadium uh, in London, which uh, houses 90,000 fans. And I believe Shad Khan, the owner of the Jaguars, owns that stadium as well. But anyways, fandom, though, is not just a thing for sports. Um, the music in industry has a lot of fans that have grown and grown over the years. Um, there are all sorts of music festivals. Of course, the most famous one in American pop culture history is Woodstock. <laughs> Three days of peace, love, and music, uh, which attracted over 400,000 people to one field, which is just kind of crazy. Um, of course, fandom also spreads to the science fiction world. Um, every year uh, at Comic-Con, lots of science fiction fans dressed as their favorite superhero or whatever gather in San Diego and have a big time. And then now even uh, the world of video games has a huge fan following. And these fans actually come together for eSports, where people sit in a stadium like that and they watch other people play video games, which is kind of crazy. Uh, this all kind of makes us nauseous, though, in 2020, <laughs> seeing all these people together. Um, so luckily enough for us, fandom is now a virtual thing as well. 
Pick any topic, any obscure topic that you're a fan of, and I guarantee you that there is an internet forum somewhere with lots of other fans. And to prove this, I typed into Reddit, which is one of these uh, fan websites. I typed in organ music, because that's what I'm a fan of. And sure enough, there was a page, and that page has 3,000 other people on it. 3,000 people for me to be friends with, right? Um, this was taken to maybe an extreme, though, this past March. Um, are you all familiar with the game Fortnite, the, the video game? The, it's, it's popular with young kids now. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a live action video game. And in the middle of the lockdowns back in March, uh, Travis Scott, who is a um, popular rapper right now, he hosted a concert within the video game in virtual time only that attracted 12 million people. 12 million people showed up to watch Travis Scott within a video game, which is kind of crazy. Um, so, as by now it's probably becoming clear, uh, our fandom is quite religious. We, have, uh, we turn out by the thousands, we turn out by the millions to see celebrities play sports or to perform. And we gladly hand over our money or our time for it. We have a deep love and an admiration for these celebrities. Modern day fanatics are not found in Roman temples. They're found in stadiums. They're found in video games. They're found in internet forums. So why is it that we pack out stadiums? What does fandom do for us? Why do we turn out in droves for concerts and now tune in by the millions to see the celebrities perform in the virtual world? What is it that drives fandom? Well, here is what uh, essayist Michael Schumann, uh, who visited San Diego Comic-Con, wrote in The New Yorker. He says that one woman, dressed as Thanos, the Marvel supervillain, told me that she got into comics after her parents died, since fancy heroes are often orphans. An IBM art director said that she became a Lost, which is a, a TV show, superfan after falling out of touch with college friends. At Comic-Con, she met people who have become part of my family. Michael Sunshine, an aspiring psychotherapist, told me, gesturing to the crowds, there are three needs that all humans have. They need to be seen, they need to be heard, and they need to be valued. The fact that he was dressed as SpongeBob SquarePants did not dilute the truth of this. So, being a fan gives us an automatic built-in community of other people to connect with. And this sort of replaces what people miss from coming to church. So from superheroes to your favorite losing sports team, such as the Jaguars, or your, your favorite obscure uh, band, there is bound to be at least one or two or three other people out there who are also fans of that thing, and that is an automatic built-in community of people to connect with. What drives fandom? Well, identification is another reason that drives fandom. Um, we not only admire and love our celebrities, we come to identify with their very lives. Uh, this is uh, the, another famous singer, uh, Beyonce. Beyonce, in this past Super Bowl, decided to sit for the national anthem. And of course, she was met with a lot of outrage. A lot of people attacked her. What was more interesting, though, was not the people attacking her. It was the people who defended her. She has a whole army of people who were ready to log on to Twitter and to, and to defend their stars as much as they could. These are some, some more mild tweets that I could find. There were some really nasty ones. Um, but anyways, uh, Beyonce has her own, she calls them beehive, the beehive of, of her fans that are ready at the drop of a hat to come to her defense. To attack her is to attack her fans. So there's that process of identification going on. What drives fandom? Well, redemption is another reason. When your team wins, you win. Uh, you have no further to look than a college football town after a big, after a big win. Um, there are some pretty funny photos of um, toilet paper being hung from the trees, and the whole atmosphere is electric. Of course, I went to Swanee, so this never happened to us. <laughs> but I'm told that, um, that it's, it's a very exciting environment to be in. And, and what do fans yell when their team wins? They yell, we won, right? <laughs> which, is kind of, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of mindless if, if you think about it. Because is it the fans who have won the football game? No, it's, it's the team itself. But somehow the athletes are acting as a sort of high priest for the fans. They are winning on behalf of their fan base. Their win has somehow been transferred to the fans. And fans feel a sort of redemptive power. 
the team wins and they win. So what drives fandom? Well, identification works in the opposite direction as well. Not only do we celebrate with our, our celebrities as they win, we also turn them into scapegoats. Our heroes, unfortunately, mess up. They get it wrong sometimes. And woe to the celebrity who betrays their fan base. There are many, many examples. The one I thought of was J.K. Rowling, who I don't think uh, it's an exaggeration to call her one of the most successful authors of all time. Her uh, Harry Potter franchise, the Harry Potter books being about the, the young wizard who goes off to wizarding school, uh, they have grossed about $25 billion from the movies, the books, the franchises, the theme parks. It's a, a big, big uh, franchise. Well, J.K. Rowling this past summer uh, made some kind of off-color remarks on Twitter about transsexuality. And her former fans, who were avid fans, viciously and mercilessly and at the drop of a hat were willing to attack the person who they worshipped. They turned on her real quick. Um, does anyone else have a, have a name of a celebrity that kind of has fallen from grace on their sheets? Good ones. Who? I don't know. Pete Rose, whoever that is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Any other good ones? Over. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. People got mad. Right. 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 So for those of you listening, um, he said uh, Drew Brees, who has been attacked for his Christian faith and being outspoken about it. Um, so yeah, so the list goes on and on, really. Um, and it's become so frequent now that there's actually a term for it, canceling. We live in cancel culture, where fans have permission, if their celebrity messes up, to cancel that person. To not only not buy all their products, but to completely begin to ignore them. And to cast this person into a sort of secular hell. So even though we're not religious anymore in the sense that we come to church, we are religious in the sense that we still believe in a judge. And that judge is not God, that judge is us. And we believe that we have the ability to turn on someone and to cast them out. So, what is going on here? How is it that celebrities and sports stars and musicians, actors, and even Spider-Man himself can attract such an enormous following and then be dumped, condemned at the drop of a hat? Why does our replacement religiosity express itself in this way? Well, the philosopher René Girard has an interesting, uh, interesting theory. Uh, this uh, is pointed out in the book by David Zoll. It's called the mimetic theory. The theory goes like this. We as humans have an ability to imitate each other, and we particularly imitate each other with each other's desires. So th imagine this. Throw two kids in a room filled with toys. What do both those kids go after? The same toy, right? They don't care about the other toys. Somehow, one seeing and wanting one toy wants the other one to also see and want that same toy. And that sort of uh, ability to mimic each other's desires plays out in all sorts of areas in our life. Um, so what one wants, the other has to have two. If we desire the same thing, of course, a rivalry, a natural rivalry emerges between us. And if this rivalry is allowed to grow and grow and grow, conflict happens. And how do we as humans deal with conflict? Well, we use a scapegoat. We find someone else to cast our anger, our frustration, our blame, our judgment onto. And the more different from us that that scapegoat is, the more effective that scapegoat can become. We can't just sit with our anger, our judgment, our powerlessness. We have to throw it somewhere. We have to cast it onto someone. So here's what Rene Girard writes. He says, everywhere and always, when human beings either cannot or dare not take their anger out on the thing that has caused it, they unconsciously search for substitutes. 
and more often than not, they find them. According to Zoll, celebrities make such great scapegoats precisely because they're so different from us. Because we build them up, we put them on a pedestal, it's easy for us to tear them down, to knock them down. Celebrities, in the words of Zoll, bear not just the, word, the burden of our hopes, but our fears as well. Because we often feel powerless in this world of ours. We, like the chaos around us is just consuming us. And this creates rage within us. And we need a scapegoat. We need a victim. In fact, we need many, many victims, if the number of canceled celebrities shows us anything. The list ranges from Drew Brees to J.K. Rowling to Ellen DeGeneres to Harvey Weinstein to Z. Sanzari to Tiger Woods. Some of these people have really done awful, awful things. But the rage that they have experienced from their former fans points to the reality of this particular seculosity. We have a need for community, which a fan base fulfills. We have a need for redemption, which also being a fan can fulfill. We also have a dark, dark need for a victim. And the seculosity of fandom gives us many, many victims to tear down. What if the fanatics have it all wrong, though? What if the community they are seeking is not built around a shared team or a shared hobby, but a shared person? And what if this person, unlike a celebrity, that they built around their community is more than just a celebrity, but the perfect fulfillment of all hopes and desires? What if this person didn't just provide a few fleeting victories, but accomplished the one victory over sin and death for all time? You, of course, see where I'm going with this. Christianity does indeed claim to give us a community centered around Christ himself, and Christianity claims that he has, claimed, he has uh, won the one victory that matters. But have you ever thought about our need for victims that we as a human have? If the seculosity of fandom shows us one thing, it is that we certainly do have a need for a scapegoat. The other being to cast on our anxieties, our fears, our powerless onto. We need to cancel as many celebrities as possible because while our fears, our anxieties, our powerlessness, they won't go away. Christianity also has a victim, but it has just one victim. And what good news that is for us. The New Testament tells us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the one and only victim needed to deal with the sins of the world. We don't need a long, long list of people, of other imperfect celebrities. We just need the perfect one. And what is more, in the words of Zal, God actively identifies with this scapegoat, with this victim who died for our sins. The innocent Jesus is like a lightning rod that all our human sin is attracted to. And by siding with this victim, scapegoating itself loses its power. We don't need a J.K. Rowling. We don't need a tar- uh, Tiger Woods or a Harvey Weinstein to carry our sins. Jesus, we believe, has done that for us. The news gets even better for us, though, according to the gospel. Imputation is another one of those church words that people, I think, their eyes kind of glaze over when they hear that word. But just like righteousness is simply enoughness and self-justification is simply personality editing, imputation is a word that really pops up in our lives over and over again. Imputation is the same thing that happens when a sports team wins a game and the fans of that team feel that victory. That victory has been imputed onto them even though they did nothing to earn that win. Unlike a sports victory, though, which eventually fades, the imputation that Christianity talks about lasts forever. The New Testament teaches us that our sins, our fears, our anxieties, our powerlessness have all been transferred to Jesus Christ. And in return, his perfection, his innocence, his righteousness, his enoughness, even his glory has been imputed onto us. Wonderful verse from 2 Corinthians. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in preparing this class on Friday, I figured out, remembered, 
that today is All Saints Day, and that, that's actually quite appropriate for us. Um, the New Testament gives us a visual of what this imputation actually looks like, and I think it's a really cool one, and we just read it in church. <laughs> so I'm going to read that if I can find it. So want to know what imputation looks like? Well, here in Revelation, we read about it. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So one of the really interesting things that we find in the book of Revelation is that it's all about the new Jerusalem coming to earth, right? What's the one, the, the, the biggest difference between the new Jerusalem and the old Jerusalem? There's no temple in the new Jerusalem. God's presence is the temple. The temple in ancient Jerusalem was just like those ancient Greek and Roman temples, had its own kind of array of priests, Levites, people doing the religious work, the sacrifices, the fanatics. They were fanatic in the ancient Jewish temple. In the New Jerusalem, there is no temple. We're all in the temple. We're all worshiping God just automatically. There's no need for fanatics. These are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We may think that we need celebrities who can be saint-like, and when they're not, we can tear them down and have them be our victims. But the revelation to John reveals to us that the real saints are the ones who have washed themselves in the blood of the Lamb. That's you and that's me. Christians might be an imperfect community of fans on earth. We simply, we, you know, do do things that are not up to the ideal that Jesus sets for us. We cast people out. We judge others. Unfortunately, that happens. But the good news for us is that the one who we are fans of is perfect. And his perfect love covers the mistakes of his saints. The object of our fandom is really worth cheering for.